Really, we want to talk about trust. What is trust? To trust someone basically is to be sure that they will do what you expect them to do. That they will do exactly what you expect them to do. That's why you trust somebody. Now, you can also trust an enemy. An enemy wants to harm you. You know that. But a friend, you trust them to protect you. Mentally, physically, spiritually. With a friend, you don't expect to lose anything. But even if you are going to lose something temporarily, or have to give something away, you believe that on balance, you're not going to lose from that experience or that relationship. You can trust a friend to back you up. You can trust a friend to be there when you need them. Typically, it comes from an experience with them over a lengthy period. You don't just say, okay, I trust you. One of, one of the fr problems that a number of people have said about me is my starting point is I'll trust somebody first. My wife is a little more suspicious. She's a little more cough, cautious, I think is probably the closer word. And we temper each other. Now, she has an intuition which I don't have. Um, a lot of ladies have intuition. They can sense things about people because they're built into them about relationships. So as a result of that, they have a sense better than men. Men are a lot simpler. Guys, are we simple? Some guys are nodding. Women, are they simple? No, no answer. Okay. Trust me, guys are extremely simple. The only way you can find out whether you can trust somebody is to become truly vulnerable and have no protection. If you have a shield or some sort of protection, you never truly find whether you can trust somebody. But when you do that, it sends a message to them that you believe that they will not take advantage of you. And frequently when you do that, people don't because they say, yes, I believe you. And this is really similar to the childlike faith that we are called to have in God. Psalm 31 was written by David as a prayer. It's as a psalm, and most psalms are turned into songs. But it's actually a prayer. And it shows us how he felt over a time when he was under physical and verbal attack and was isolated from his friends. It's not clear whether it was written during the time where King Saul was chasing him and King Saul wanted to prevent him from being the king or Absalom, his son, who wanted to prevent him from coming back to being the king. We don't know. The psalm can be divided into five sections. The first section, which is really verses 1 to 4, and I'll cover that in a bit more detail in a minute, covers his cry for God's righteousness to be his refuge and protect him from shame. He, want, he was being accused of various things. And he wanted God to protect him from that. Verses 5 to 8 covers the expression of David's total trust in God as a place of safety and rejoicing. In verses 9 to 13, it covers his lament. If you read Lamentations, it's a lot of woe is me, woe is me. And that's sort of what David's doing here. It's the danger he's faced and what is the impact on his body and his emotions. Verse 14 to 18 covers his prayers for deliverance from his enemies who pursue him and again try to destroy his reputation. And finally, in verses 19 to 24, they cover his praise of God and his exhortation to others to trust in God. Now I want to break down the first four verses. The first three verses there are also in Psalm 71. Now it's not plagiarism, because David wrote both. So he can use it. It's okay. But he did for a purpose because it's the same essence in both Psalms. He calls God his rock, his refuge, his fortress, but he asks God to deliver him from a trap. There's a contrast there. 
It means there's a place of safety while there is a trap set out there for him. He pleads with God that he should never be put to shame while saying God should protect his own name. If you think about it, we're called to be living sacrifices. We're called to go out to the world. When we go out to the world as Christians, if people know that we are Christians and we fall, it's not just our name that gets affected, it's God. So what David is saying is protect my name and my shame so that your name doesn't get affected as well. He prays in a way that, he, that says, not only does he know God's character, he also knows how to get God's attention. How many people would like to get God's attention? Eh, about 40% of your congregation will get God's attention. You, need, you and I need to talk. <laughs> David is consor- concerned about falling into a trap that would lead to his name being destroyed so that he suffers from shame. He wants to avoid feeling like a failure in the eyes of those who are important to him. And I think that's true for all of us. We don't want to appear a failure in front of others. Because if we do, we feel ashamed. We just don't want to go out. And it it affects our lives. It affects the way we think. It affects the way we interact if we feel shame. But God doesn't want us to feel shame. He wants us to trust in him, that he will vindicate us and show the truth to those who seek to destroy us. In life, some people actually seek to get up in an organization or even in a family, ingratiate themselves, put themselves above another level by setting a trap for somebody else so that they lose their credibility. In other words, you you say things then you're drawn into a conversation where you have to say things. If anybody's seen trials on TV, they get them to say yes or no. The yes or no does not give you the chance to justify or explain what's happened. And that's what some people do in real life. They say, did you do this? Did you do this? You have to say yes. But they don't look at the motive. And they try and bring shame to you in front of others by doing that. It can also leave leaving us feeling so bad about ourselves that we don't want to deal with this person again or even try to explain what really happened because you think there's no point. It feels like it's, there's point, no point to actually do it. In the Lord's Prayer, Jesus tells us to pray, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. King James says the evil one. May this be your prayer. If somebody is setting you a trap for humiliation, don't fall into the trap. Ask the Lord to protect you so that you don't fall into that trap. And that's what David does. In verses 5 to 8, we talk about the trust in God as a place of safety or rejoicing. This is what David is doing. He makes a dramatic statement that really indicates trust when he says in verse 5, Into your hands I commit my spirit. Redeem me, O Lord, the God of truth. Does this sound familiar? Somebody else said, Into your hands I commit my spirit. Jesus on the cross. Jesus said that in Luke 23, 46. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, Into your hands I commit my spirit. When he said that, he breathed his last. He trusted God, the Father, his Father, that God would do something. He sought the glory for his Father, not for himself. But he knew that God would glorify him. That's why I love reading John 17. John 17 is a fantastic prayer. It's not the longest prayer in the Bible. Solomon's is. But John 17 is one of passion, and I love passion.